This is the Stark Truth, hosted by Robert Stark. Brought to you by StarkTruthRadio.com. Robert Stark is an American journalist and political commentator. You can listen to his podcast at www.starktruthradio.com. This is uh, Robert Stark. I'm uh, joined here with uh, Josh Seidner. We're going to be discussing the book uh, Bobos in uh, Paradise by uh, David Brooks. Uh, Josh, great talking to you. Yeah, once again, it's great to be on the show with yourself and Matthew. Very honored to be here. So uh, on the topic of Bobos, I just got back from uh, Whole Foods, which pretty much is the ultimate Bobo <laughs> est- uh, establishment. And I uh, I had for dinner uh, bratwurst and sauerkraut. Excellent. Yeah, kind of, third worldism. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's exactly. a lot of products there, as it says in the movie Fight Club, like you know, uh, made by the indigenous peoples of wherever. <laughs> right, like quinoa, or, you know. And I, I like quinoa, organic. But is yeah, probably, it's, yeah. I guess I guess like the organic term is probably you know the key uh, operative. All of us basically kind of overlap with this uh, demographic. We overlap with it, but we're all at the same time, we're sort of outsiders of it at the same time, but we're interconnected to it, which creates an interesting dynamic. Well, and I mean, often people that are like that are usually the biggest threats, you know, and certainly I'm sure there's somebody out there watching things that knows that and is, is looking for those kinds of outlier people who know the inner workings of... Uh, you know the the uh, privileged class, but are not quite in it for a variety of reasons. It may have been that they were rejected. It may have been that uh, they they left voluntarily. It may have been that something about them didn't quite fit. You know, any of those things are possible. Yeah, that's definitely for sure. And we'll we'll definitely uh, get, get to that. I just want to give a kind of a basic introduction. So Bobos is the concept of David Brooks. I'm not sure if he coined the term but it's a hybrid of the two terms, uh, bourgeois and bohemian. So basically, bobos are uh, capitalist uh, neoliberal hippies. Or hipsters right. is another way of saying it. I well, mean, yeah, I hipsters think hipsters are the yeah. millennial offshoots. The original bobos were the boomers in the 90s who were yuppies in the 80s, but originally part of the hippie um, counterculture in the 60s. Uh, Josh, do you want to give some background information on David Brooks. So he was kind of a neocon who supported uh, George Bush, and then he was like the token uh, conservative for the New York Times, and then part of the Never Trumper. So, I mean, he's definitely not one of us, but I do think he has a lot of things to say that are insightful. Right, and if you read Brooks, you know, you see... Have you guys ever heard of the term uh, Atlantic accent before? Oh, yeah, it's sort of a... Hi, it's sort of an accent of the up of the upper class uh, right. wasp elite. I'm not sure if it's more. Is it more New England or more like it, Virginia, it's, it's Maryland? De- it's, de- it's definitely a New England thing, and uh, you know, it was a term that was used in the early 20th century. It used to describe a way of speaking English that was not quite American, you know, and not quite British. You know, so they don't have they don't have an unmistakable British accent, but it's British enough so that you know, they, they get, uh, other Brits, you know, where the money was. Um, you know, can see these markers of affluence, and you know, so you have this like old money, this American old money group, and Brooks is very much part of that. And I think for people certainly who were born after 1970, that group really very much disappeared. And you know, they, the millennials especially are, are very unacquainted with that kind of culture that sort of it either disappeared or it morphed uh, or changed its appearance sometime after the 60s, you know, which is roughly what the book is about. You know, there's some things that I disagree with the book, you know, the way that Brooks sort of writes about things, but there's a lot of it certainly was very uh, prophetic, 
you know, he goes into details about this, about how the Bohemians, who were supposed to be these idealists, uh, very much associated with Marxist ideals, somehow crossbred with the uh, bourgeois, you know, who were the enemies of the Marxists. You know, I mean, Brooks is definitely coming from that. It, and in a lot of ways, he was he was really the, the the last of the Mohicans. You know, he's really the the only writer I can think of that sort of like carried, uh, you know, some of those ways of looking at the world into the seventies and eighties in a way that's at least somewhat historically contiguous, right? And he you know he wrote this book. He did a lot of other things. You know, Bobo's in Paradise, and that's basically what it's about. It's about how this group morphed and changed into something that resembled the, the hippie movement, you know, and uh, I suppose there's a lot of different ways that we can go from there, and I know you mapped out a couple before. There was this backlash against uh, Reaganomics the whole, in the 80s era. It became kind of like there was this era of the 80s were associated with uh, hyper uh, materialism, and during the 90, early 90s recession, there was some resentment against the wealthy and against Reaganomics, so a lot of these people wanted to reinvent themselves. And then, this basically, the cultural trend of the Bobos, so it coincided, the Clintonite neoliberal hijacking of the left. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, let's put it into even better context. You're sort of taking out what happened in the 70s with Carter. You know, so before Reagan, there was Carter, and Carter's policies were exactly the opposite. I mean, he focused... On minority groups, that was probably his really his standard. He was the standard bearer for that. You know, he's the one who took these minority um, these minority politics and brought them to the national sort of establishment. So, really, Reagan was a response to all that, all of these things that had happened. You know, an interesting aspect of the '80s were were a group called the Reagan Democrats. Yeah, so there was this group called the Reagan Democrats, and this was a group that supposedly, you know, they they were essentially Democrats in in their DNA, you know, very often non WASP people, and they sort of switched sides over to the to the Republicans during the Reagan election, and that's what resulted in the landslide victory for Reagan in California. So, you know, there was a lot of shifting going on, like you know, a lot of ideology and values that were changing that's really somewhat difficult to to map out you know exactly what what had gone what had gone on you know it, it had very much to do with the boomers you know suddenly i think as you noted you know we had a, a time when the boomers went very much from like a socialist mindset as in we need to redistribute the wealth to this like everybody deserves what they get or you know work, hard work is the key to success you know that was kind of a a, a change in their attitude, which unfortunately, you know, these attitudes also empowered the very, um, the very, very wealthy. You know, the the uh, the, Koch, the Koch brothers uh, of the world, and those people, you know, they profited from this change in attitude, which the boomers felt was going to benefit them, and they essentially just took complete control of the economy since then you know you can look at the numbers um in terms of wealth disparity and it's become progressively more horrific since the 80s or 90s so uh basically both uh, bohemians and and the bourgeoisie those were uh concepts that emerged uh after the french revolution right um at least that's how Brooks sort of, sort of outlines, um, you know, where these people came from. And if I remember, if I recall correctly, Marx actually had a little bit of a different take on it. You know, he outlined the rise of the of the bourgeois, you know, after the Renaissance, I believe. Um, but don't quote me on that. So yeah, that's that's basically what Brooks says. You know, he says that after uh, the French Revolution, you know, they, the nobility was, you know, they essentially decapitated the French society and. That left, um, you know, the priesthood and um, the like, the merchant class, and those two people sort of seized power. You know, there, there's quite a number of stories about what happened to the clergymen after the French Revolution. Many of them were killed by 
the revolutionaries, but some of them sort of moved into different organs of the state and, you know, the emerging uh, academia and, and became this new character that you still find, you find in French society today, which is like this philosopher. You know, French are very much into this, into this character called the philosopher. And you know, he's like a prophet almost. And he, you know, he tells everybody how they're supposed to live and how society's supposed to be. And then, you know, the French talk about it and consider it. They're, they're very, they're very much uh, into this idea of like discussing these deep ideas. And then, you know, they, they, they try to shape their, their social policy around that stuff. Those are some historical origins that uh, Brooks discusses. So uh, you were talking about uh, Reagan and uh, this generation of uh, boomers who were, they were uh, youth during the 60s era. So with the whole 80s uh, yuppie culture, uh, whatever you can say about it, there was, a, there was it was very much uh, upfront and honest about what it was all about. Well, I mean, one thing that I observed um, when when the 90s rolled around was like this complete and total erosion of like workplace standards and like the concept of work. You know, this idea that you know what what exactly your roughly you know generally what are your obligations to employers? How you're supposed to treat them? How the employer is supposed to treat you? You know what your your expectations should be and and how the uh, how the employer is going to meet those expectations. All those things were literally like thrown out the window in in favor of this what you know what they were sort of championing. They were they were saying this is a really great thing that was going to happen. You know that everyone's going to be this freelancer and we'd be like these happy little bees buzzing around, you know, and, and we'd find a little flower and then like pollinate it and then suddenly the entire country would be this like this this great garden of Eden, you know, with uh, endless wealth. You know, I, I mean, I've never even witnessed a single year of that, let alone, uh, you know, what the anything close to what the promises of that were. So what happened was, you know, this, this all this concept of employment got completely eroded. The boomers ignored the whole thing because most of them were on the tail end of their careers anyway. They didn't need it, and they had enough capital saved up that, you know, they maybe some of them were smarter and could see these changes happening and knew they could no longer re- rely so much on their employment situation then they move their money into real estate and we all know what happened there but you know you know i find like that the boomers you know they're very um uh hypocritical you know they 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 changed their story considerably from the time that they were you know in their late teens to 20s when they're talking about equality and socialism and the moment that they sort of get established and the story changes to basically reaganomics and I mean, I hear them say "f the unions" all the time. You know, as if, as if they're the enemy. If you go back to the original uh, '60s counterculture, it was much more. I mean, there were certainly a lot of legitimate issues like fighting against the Vietnam War, but the uh, overall uh, uh, cultural aspect was much more about having a cultural revolution against their parents' generation than it was about uh, economic uh, inequality. Because they were, they grew up, they came from an era of prosperity. So their main rebellion was about culture, not so much uh, sure. an economic rebellion. So that was their cultural origins. And then they went on to become uh, prosperous. And it's also the question of you know what, you know, did did the elites, the you know, the very very wealthy, poison some of these movements as well? That that's also I think a very, fairly valid question. Certainly not one that not only I myself have asked before. You know, like how did this you know, during the 60s, especially coming, you know, like leading up to maybe like 1967, you know, the, the very, very wealthy were, were legitimately concerned that America was going to turn, like the system was going to turn on its head. You know, kind of like this, the environment that we have today where people are really starting to think, you know, there's going to be a turnover of government here. You know, we're going to have a military coup and things are just going to go crazy. You know, keep in mind that, you know, before... Martin Luther King, you know, you had all those civil rights things. You know, there were there were periods where uh, some of these people were literally like burning down uh, cities in the South. It was a real civil disorder scenario, and you know, the the very wealthy people who still own this country were extremely concerned about that. You know, it was it wasn't just a bunch of uh, rich kids from the suburb, white rich kids from the suburbs smoking pot. That's not what the sixties was about. And you know, often millennials, you know, people who sort of uh, you know, arrived, uh, were born much later, you know, they look back at that time as a bunch of people who just sort of were doing drugs and having 
sex and stuff, but there's a hell of a lot more to the 60s than that. So I tend to think, you know, that maybe we focus on those aspects of the 60s because that's what, you know, they want us to focus on. They want us to think that, you know, this decade was really about drugs and fun and essentially just being a degenerate. When really, that's not what it was about. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, unfortunately, that has that is what it's remembered for in very like um, kitschy kind of media. So it gets produced that references that ideal of the '60s. But I mean, I've I've done some research on it. I've long been fascinated by the '60s, and uh, I mean, there definitely was a lot of genuinely um, radical thinking going on. Um, people were studying, uh, you know, the Frankfurt School and. And even people like Mao. I mean, there's a lot of economic leftism, in other words. But what survived sure. the legacy of the '60s is pretty much entirely in terms of social liberalism, and that kind of did fuse with the economic conservatism in the '80s. Right, and well, and how much of that was these bo- these Bobo characters, you know, who sort of were really essentially imposters, and you know, they they. They, they basically own the media and those are the points that they choose to focus on you know like to them 60s was Woodstock it was a bunch of rock concerts it was you know some burning of bras and, and a couple of other you know in my view very trivial kinds of movements when you know they totally ignore the real meated potatoes of what, what actually was happening in the 60s you know there, there's another there's another factor to the 60s that also is commonly over, ignored which is what was going on in the USSR at the time you know, the people who were leading our country during the 60s were absolutely terrified of the threat of the USSR and what it really meant you know, to the American program. You know, a lot of people view America in different ways. You know, some, some people you might ask, they'll tell you that you know, we're the homeland of freedom. Other people well, will that, say we're yeah, the homeland of freedom. Well, yeah, that is part of the reason because that uh, there were these uh, economic populist policies implemented, I mean, starting with the New Deal, so... There was concern sure. that there would be a backlash a against, yeah, backlash against yeah, the elites yeah. either in a uh, communist direction or like left-wing populism. But there was also concern about right-wing populism or rise of fascism, basically directed right. against the elites. So the they realized they needed to provide. So what I mean, whatever you think about FDR's, mo- FDR's con- motives, con- uh, the, there was a concession uh, to the people of the country. And uh, Eisenhower kind of continued that legacy, and then it was continued to some degree to the 60s, and gradually it started to get chipped away, and Reagan, I mean, things started to get really bad under Reagan and Clinton and both Bush Sr. and the, the more recent George Bush. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of it, yeah, it did got gradually chipped away, and then now we have these issues now. When, I mean, one interesting point with this whole Bobo phenomenon is the elites morph into so basically something different by changing their appearance. So uh, as you were, you were talking about in the beginning, Josh, we have this obscene amount of income inequality. What's really fascinating is there is less cultural contrast. So, so Josh, what were your sort of observations? Uh, you grew up, well, you were a kid in the 80s, which was before this whole phenomenon. So you grew up in the North Shore of Long Island around a lot of wealth. So what were some of your observations about the cultural differences between the wealthy and middle class that have kind of well, been blurred uh, more recently? Well, I mean, one of, one of the things that I noticed changed over the years, certainly, was, you know, during the 80s, and I was very young at the time, but I could you could still sort of detect it that there was a very clear sense of you know who this group of very wealthy was and we knew that they were um we were opposed to them you know there wasn't really any question that um you know who was the good guys and who who were the bad guys right and you know by the time the 90s rolled around all of those lines got severely blurred and you know finally the millennial server, the millennial generation arrived. Those, these kids don't even seem to understand even anything about what, you know what they're reading or or who's even writing it. Yeah, and that's a really important thing. I mean, I noticed you know with the rise of social media, like the the whole notion of authorship has been almost completely removed. People don't really seem to care who is saying what they're reading. They're, you know, they're only really interested in sort of 
picking apart the logic. You know, does it conflict with my logic or does it not conflict with my logic? I think Aristotle said you know, in the, that a convincing argument rests on three main things, and that's um, pathos, logos, and, and the most important one, ethos. You know, who are you listening to? And I think that had a lot to do with it. You know, the, a lot of the changes in who could say what you know who could say something to the public or who may who is able to say it anonymously or you're or allowed to say it through proxies uh, even our, our media ownership laws changed dramatically roughly around the late 90s i think we've discussed that before the dmca that that was really only one policy in a collection of policies that was a, a total um reordering of the way that our media worked. We had a lot of strict laws about who could own things. You, know, you, you weren't allowed to monopolize the media in a, in a given place. And there were laws about if somebody wanted to open up a, an independent uh, newspaper, for instance, then there were certain laws that would, that, would let, that would help them to do that. All those things were removed in the late 90s. And it, you know, it comes as no surprise that we're basically like living in this, this, this propaganda environment that's easily as bad as communist Russia probably worse so with the whole cultural issue uh there are a lot of, i mean there's kind of a blurring of uh, cultural distinctions i mean yeah i wasn't i'm too young to remember the 80s but one thing from watching movies like if you watch a movie from the 80s they'll show uh, uh wealthy people go out to a uh, classical music concert or to the opera when uh, bobo uh, today is more likely to do something that is or the, uh, Bobo will go to like you have these like boomers who go to Burning Man, and that's like the thing to do today. Well, or the Grateful 80- Dead. Yeah, well, in the eighties it would be more likely to go like those those types of people would go to a go to an opera. So there's this uh, blurring of uh, class, and and then back in the fifties uh, we had more economic equality, but the class distinctions were much uh, uh, stronger. So uh, it's hard, really hard to say if it's by design because it well, is very, like, yeah, it is very, it, but it is very fascinating that the same era when uh, income inequality and these policies that were implemented to basically exacerbate income inequality under neoliberalism, we saw the kind of boring of uh, cultural class distinctions. Right, and, and I think that we we mentioned perhaps uh, you know off uh, this discussion about how some of these like Generation Z guys, you know, especially all writer, are trying to revive. You know some of the kind of cultural forms of the upper classes prior to the boboization. You know they're into they go to mm. they'll do things like go to like an opera or something. You know almost in like an ironic way, or they'll grow a beard. You know that looks like something out of the 19th century. Oh yeah, you know, and I so guess you, people who are kind of the the types of people we're talking about, and we kind of fit into this category as well. Uh, they're people who are uh, intelligent. But they're kind of outside of that elite circle, so they're they're going to kind of latch on to uh, symbols of the upper class or even aristocracy of the past. So it could be ancient Rome, it could be uh, right. 18th uh, century European aristocracy, or it could even be the kind of a uh, even the sort of uh, fascination with 80s aesthetics and all that. The whole phenomenon there was like a Trump wave, and then or just the whole kind of vapor wave general genre in general. There's definitely a fascination with that. Well, that, was, that and then, was... and then beyond, I mean, beyond that, there's also a kind of interest in uh, futuristic aesthetics, which I also think is it's different than nostalgicizing the aristocracy of the past. But that's also a fascinating element as well, because both are kind of rebellions sure. against the status quo. Yeah, they definitely all could be understood as um, trying to move past this uh, bobolization of what it means to be. Um, culturally elite because we've reached a point where that's that's achieved a totality where you know it's rich kids having like barn weddings and you know <laughs> drinking craft beer like all these things are yeah. kind of fetishization of a uh, of uh, not only on uh, this like kind of lower class or class distinctions blurred but also rural lifestyle I mean that's just reached oh, yeah. uh, a fever pitch so but that you do see this nostalgia in, in like the alt right uh, for various forms whether it's opera i mean you see people on the daily storm or like we've talking about how much he likes opera um but also yeah like we're talking about on this show with futurism uh, and, and even the 80s because i think the 80s is kind of the last breath of this um older uh more traditional kind of elitism 
Sure, and a lot of the fashions even came. I remember them coming back in the eighties. You know, for one thing, one thing that was noticeable. I still remember this in the eighties when the haircut suddenly completely changed. Like they went from some variation of the seventies, which was kind of like either an afro or like semi long hair. You know, it was very for a while in the late seventies and early eighties. A lot of males would just kind of like wear their hair like semi long. You know, kind of like an emo cut or something, I think, maybe is, is something you can relate to if you're a little bit younger. <laughs> and then suddenly, yeah, and then suddenly, like, uh, it all, it, everybody had to have this, like, military cut, you know, and they, they wanted it buzzed in the side. I remember going to the barber, and, like, this, I remember him obsessing over this. Do you want it, do you want your hair over your ears or not? Because, like, I guess in his world, there was a sudden dramatic shift, you know, from, like, these 70s hairstyles to, like this military do, yeah, yeah, or like the Hitler Youth haircut almost. Not to put oh too, yeah, uh, yeah they, sharp ahead yeah, on it, they, they, and that's come back. And that that's a point that's interesting sure. to me. I mean, you see like a Richard Spencer's very famous haircut. A lot of it's the fashy haircut that a lot of alt right types have. But that actually yeah. became popular well, in the that, culture. Like yeah. uh, the guy, the lead singer of Maroon Five had that cut for a while. So that kind of came back in the two thousands. And you wonder. I mean, I think there's an unconscious element to why some of these trends come back. Sure. Well, what does a haircut look like that sort of denote? It's you know you look more kind of uh, imposing. Uh, you know, it, it tends to bring out the shape of your cheekbones, and you know there, there's certain kinds of like uh, you know real um, things that it does to your to your face and the way that people perceive you. I guess which is more more uh, it's more like acceptable or or more um, desirable under certain cultural conditions. But, you know, my point was that, you know, the 80s is just, there's a reason why, you know, all these guys are going back to the 80s, because the 80s was the last time that we had a situation like like this, where, you know, certain things broke down, and suddenly pockets of the population wanted almost like a form of fascism. It, it was really all over the place. Like, you know, I, I work in communications and technology, like uh, the FCC, like their policy changed a lot. There was Powell, you know, he's related to the famous, the military Powell. Um, he was the FCC chairman, and, like, his policy was against this concept of freedom of information. Mm -hmm. his, his argument was freedom of information actually degrades communication, and there's certainly logic in that. You know, so, so that kind of an idea, you know, that information should be top-down, which is, which is obviously a feature of fascist systems, that was even found in American thinking at that time. There's a lot of parallels. Yeah, for sure. The elite group we're talking about, uh, they engage in uh, fake uh, social climbing. So they're they're basically uh, conformist, but they pose as nonconformist, and they use that as a way to uh, they use virtue signaling to climb socially. And then they play a role in uh, guiding political discussions, and they. They view themselves, they're basically like these uh, self-appointed uh, moral leaders. Right, and, and, you know, I think the key thing is here is, um, you know, it's like contradiction and hypocrisy. And, uh, you know, I think I mentioned a couple of this in some of our preliminary discussions. Um, you know, environmentalism is a very good example of that. You know, like, it, it, of all the values that you see in this Bobo crowd, environmentalism is easily number one. And, of course, you have things like controversial matters like um, carbon, uh, you know, CO2, Issues, which, depending on who you talk to, may or may not actually be a problem. But you know, they, they're all—they're all seem to uh, passionately, uh, obsessively uh, concern themselves with this problem of environmental degradation. And meanwhile, you know, they're—they're they're like invested in Monsanto. You know, they're invested in mining operations in Africa. You know, they, they are the ones that are responsible for these problems. So it's you know, it's a kind of like fig leaf, really. You know, they—they're covering. You know who they really are, like what what is their their actual nature, um, and this kind of thing. This is where I sort of differ with Brooks. I don't think this is really so much of a new thing. You know, you had this you know, all throughout Europe. You know, the middle class would often use Christian values or the semblance of Christian values you know, as a way to kind of justify and rationalize slavery, for instance. You know, mm -hmm. like take you know take slavery, okay. Um, the, basically, for for a time in Europe, a good hundred years, you know, we would go. They would go to Africa. They would they would take the natives there by force. They would bring them to the New World and get them to work, and then they would make profit off of that. And how did they sort of maintain their their guises 
as morally superior people through the use of uh, Christianity. You know, they would pay the the ministers and the or the priests, and the priests literally at one point the, the Pope would bless the slave ships as they made their way from I think it was uh, England, maybe perhaps mm-hmm. Spain. And then on their way to the new world. It, I mean, it is basically like a uh, se- secular religion, because it's more because I mean, there's I mean, you see the same with the whole uh, immigration issue. Uh, massive immigration from the third world is basically an example of a uh, capitalist exploitation, but they're able to frame it in the moral framework that they're morally right. superior, and uh, people who oppose a uh, who oppose a. Um, Open borders and letting in all these uh, races. yeah migrants from the third world are uh, cold-hearted, uh, bigoted people. Right, it's 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 exactly the same thing, you know. And by the way, you know, even that that's not even a new thing. Uh, the, they used to do this in the Roman Empire, or even empires prior to Rome. They would, you know, move uh, different cultures around, mix them up together in order to prevent uprisings. You know, there was a very that's a very old sort of technique, you know, that's existed and, and well documented. So even that's not even particularly new. No, and the, and the question that motivation is really somewhat ignorant. I mean, it's it's very obvious why it's happening. It's you know to prevent solidarity. Yeah, because if in order to have a labor, a cohesive labor movement, uh, I mean, yeah, people. There have been cases of people, different groups working together. I'm not saying I'm opposed to that, but in a homogenous uh, society that where there's more uh, cohesion, there's more likely to be a, a cohesive labor movement. Well, in a right. culture that it's more ethnically diverse and fragmented, then it's easier for the the corporate and economic elites to exploit people. And this has also sure. coincided with the decline of the labor movement. As you were saying before, I think in the past, a lot of people... I mean, it was pretty obvious a lot of people with the traditional labor movement, they uh, felt like they were being exploited. But, I mean, a lot of people have been kind of duped into... They've been duped into thinking by the media that there is this uh, socially uh, conscious elite that is looking out for them. I mean, in an ideal society, you do want an elite that has a sense of noblesse oblige, that cares about the good of of a society... But we basically have yeah. the most corrupt elite in American history, but they've duped so many Easily. people into thinking that they're socially conscious. Sure, and I mean, there's parallels to the church there as well, too. Obviously, the priests were posing as, you know, benevolent fathers. You know, they make sure to use the term, uh, you know, of all of the uh, laity, you know, during the late Middle Ages, you know, convincing them that um, they're actually looking out for their best interests. You know, you have the same exact thing happening today. You know, these people are posing as their, as our, you know, the our ministers of equality or ministers of excellence or ministers of innovation, even. And they're they're really doing none of those things. So, Josh, you worked in the Silicon Valley. I think the Silicon Valley uh, personifies this more than any other uh, industry. So, uh, yeah. But the thing about the Silicon Valley is because, unlike with Wall Street. They weren't uh, attached to the whole kind of uh, baggage of the past, like the whole uh, robber baron era and a lot of that. They were able to uh, right. actually successfully uh, invent themselves as these uh, social, as a sort of socially uh, conscious uh, industry. So there's the whole theme of... Uh, I mean, we've done uh, countless shows on the tech industry and income inequality in the Bay Area, but there's, I mean, there's sure. that whole issue. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg personifies that. And there's a whole kind of uh, aesthetic aspect of that, like the whole kind of a casual, like the casual work thing, where they how they dress as opposed to the traditional uh, business suits. Well, here's like I mean a good example of that you said like that everybody dresses casually. You know, the the idea of dressing casually is that, you know you don't have to wear very expensive sorts of clothes, right? I mean that's that's the concept in principle. However, you, you go to these places and then. They're basically had cultivated a kind of fashion style where you know that requires investments of hundreds of dollars for a shirt in order to dress casually, which shows you like you know these, these like idiotic. <laughs> oh, there was that trend. I, I mean, I forget where this was, but people were spending a thousand dollars to buy a teared up, uh, ripped up jeans. I forget when that was. Oh. Maybe was oh. that around like two yeah, thousand? Sure. 
that was going on when I was younger in, in the 80s. Oh, I really? remember that. Really? Like, designer rib scenes. Oh, yeah, that's old. That's very many decades old. Yeah. Oh, I think a better uh, example would but, be um, those shoes Tom's, for instance. I mean, I don't remember. Do you guys remember Tom's? I do roughly remember it. I mean, um, that's like cause... peak Bobo to me. I mean, those are just like the most basic shoe you can imagine. Supposedly, like every pair you bought would donate a certain amount of money to some issue in some third world country. And uh, yeah, they're like, I don't remember exactly how much they were, but they were like way more expensive than they look, like 80 bucks, 80 bucks a pop. And they were a real status symbol in like the late 2000s. But there's stuff like that that emerges. Well, like, for instance, I mean, try showing up to a Silicon Valley meeting in a Walmart polo and see what happens. <laughs> see how many people <laughs> actually listen to what they have to say. You know, it's not really about casual. It really isn't. It's it's just, it's about a new set of values, um, and, and and it's about different standards for maintaining those values. You know, but really, ultimately, they're they're the same in essence. You know, it's displaying your wealth, displaying your status, and you know, you do it in much the same way by spending lots of money on your clothes and focusing on the brand names and same things that they used to do with Armani and. Uh, you know, any other sort of tailor or... I'm not one of those people who totally uh, rejects having nice stuff or rejects materialism, but the important thing is you want to have stuff that is of a high aesthetic standard. And uh, what's really disgusting is this whole uh, notion of uh, buy- basically buying stuff purely to demonstrate status rather than uh, high aesthetics. In some ways, I mean, the people who are real... This really, there's this kind of really, like, vulgar... Uh, crafts materialism, but at least, at least there's like a sense of honesty. To there's this. an honesty. To yeah, it, yeah, I mean this is really. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, with the whole hipster scene, it's basically uh, the millennial offshoot of the bobos, the bobo culture. What's interesting is the boomers define themselves as rebelling against their parents' generation. So basically, uh, the hit with the hipsters, uh, they basically uh, they're just an offshoot of their parents. Take a look at like Williamsburg or um, the Mission District. You know, like it's filled with these people who, you know, are are onerous. They're odious to virtually everybody, but their own little clique. You know, we call those people hipsters, right? You know, they, they're they're notorious for their fakeness. You know, for their uh, hypocrisy and for their duplicity. And you know what we just described there is very obvious. You know, there's like basically capital. Uh, you know, moving into these areas. You know, some, someone very very wealthy buys out a whole bunch of buildings. Suddenly, uh, a neighborhood that was once known as being a complete shithole is suddenly in the papers. Now it's like an up and coming area. Look at that, right? And then suddenly the attitudes of the police in the area change magically. You know, of course, there's no under the table payments going on there. And before you know, you know that all those people own all of this expensive property, which is now cool, and their kids who are posing as these kind of like street people are the owners of these properties. So, you know, yeah, that, that's certainly what happened in Williamsburg. Yeah, like they're called uh, Trustafarian. It's kind of this uh, right. like a leisure class and we, I mean, we, ta- we did a whole show on this, uh, Matt and I, about the, mm-hmm. I mean, the rule of a leisure class and as a uh, the people who become engaged in our culture, but the thing is, the le- yeah, this this leisure class uh, is dominated. It's basically the the children of the economic elites. Well, part of their success at doing this, and you know, the the reason why they've they've successfully essentially dominated ninety nine percent of the population is through this sort of. Um, this fakeness that they have. I, I use an analogy. You know, there's like this this insect, and I think I mentioned it, you I m- mentioned this to you guys before. Like, there's this insect, uh, you know, who they, they, it, it like has a special adaptation. It was it, it found a way to emit like a certain kind of hormone or, or like a pheromone, I guess you'd call it, so that ants cannot detect that it's actually not an ant, right? And these these insects, which you know, if you look at it visually, it's very striking. Like they're much larger than than the ants. They look nothing like an ant, and they just kind of like casually stroll into these things and start eating all the ants and having a, a party. And uh, it's it's very similar thing. You know, like th- this group of people has found a way to sort of infiltrate, um, you know, like like cultures, I guess you'd say cultural yeah, values. It's created. It's it's uh, flooded the kind of marketplace and. Uh... They're subsidized by uh, 
by the elites, so it, it makes it difficult for uh, for kind of a a healthier uh, cultural competition. So the people who produce the best culture, they're not the ones being uh, rewarded. Um, Amad and I were doing this show about this whole issue of gentrification and uh, urban uh, colonization. And uh, Matt, you can comment on this, but I, th- I think re- I mean, recolonizing a lot of these urban areas and building, I mean, building really great communities uh, can be a great thing. And we discussed that, but there has to be a sense of uh, honesty. I mean, we talked about it in a more, a more kind of a positive way. Yeah, well, I have a somewhat different take on some of this uh, uh, as Josh, I guess. I mean, I, I don't see the, as we were talking about in our shows on L.A. and San Francisco, I don't see gentrification as necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think it definitely creates conflicts, and I can understand the other side. But I fundamentally think that um, things like gentrification can be can be a great thing, new, sort of new urbanism. I mean, I do think the prob- my biggest problem with, I guess, hipsters is this kind of... Um, moral veneer that has their ideology has kind of reduced to this SJWism. I do think that's sure. fading away and I'm interested to see what could come um, next. I basically agree with that. I think because if you basically look at history, the white middle classes were driven out of urban areas and uh, into the suburbs. So, I mean, urban recolonization is a uh, positive thing. If it's, what we're at, what we were talking about our show is advocating something that is uh, more uh, honest. It's more kind of this. These people put on this uh, moral veneer, and it's for a very kind of a small group of people. What we're talking about actually would benefit a much larger number of people. I mean, because this kind of a uh, lifestyle in these uh, small uh, pockets, like uh, William, Williamsburg. It's not really accessible to like the large numbers of middle class whites who were driven out into the suburbs. Hipsters are kind of the classically uh, self hating whites, um, and I think uh, that there is something to this idea of a, of a different a different group of people who don't who who have kind of moved away from that ideology and are in fact more okay with being white um, and um, kind of formulate basically what you have. The hipster, in my opinion, is a kind of a lost uh, upper middle class, usually white, um, you know, kid who who's just craving authenticity and can't find it in their own um, in their own culture, in, in white culture, and so instead, uh, you know, appropriates freely. Whether I mean, hipsters are the ones that are accused of cultural appropriation of different races; they definitely do that. But they all you also see them appropriating from from different subculture, different white subcultures in the past. So you see them. Appropriate from the hippies, from punks, from grunge. They're just they're just very appropriative beings. They're craving this authenticity that is like forever lost on them, and they end up looking extremely fake. And I don't know. I guess what I would advocate is uh, I identify with that. Uh, you know, I I basically have been a hipster in my life, and I identify with that sort of um, socioeconomic group of people. I just think we're at a point where um, that old style of being of um, of being this kind of a pro, you know, appropriative being uh, with this moral veneer of liberalism, I think that is truly dying, and I'm interested to see what could come next. Like what what comes after the irony, and that's a that's a question. And you know what 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 could the new subculture be? I, I agree completely with Matt here, and I was going to virtually say exactly the same thing. That you know the, the psychological profile is is much more complex than just. You know, dad like sitting something down, like, okay, you need to look like the poor people, and then report back <laughs> to us four years from now. You know, it's it's not, it doesn't really work that way. Like like Matt said, um, you know, there's a lot of like self out there. You know, they they have a certain sort of emptiness inside. You know, they they for some reason despise middle class mediocrity. That's a very old older term. You know, for that you would find often amongst the hip, the hippies of the '60s. You know, they would criticize this there's something about middle class life that they didn't like and you know it's the same kind of mentality that some of these kids have people are craving something uh, uh authentic and i think the show we did about urbanism we we actually do uh, address these issues we present like a positive uh, vision for uh urban life because a lot of the problems that people are attracted to this is uh i mean i'm sure uh, europe has a lot of the. I mean, Europe definitely has these same uh, issues and cultural subcultures, and they have bobos as well. 
and the hipster subculture. But I think there's something unique about America where a lot of people uh, find uh, just generic middle class suburban life as being just really bland and boring. And uh, in the past, I mean, in the past, you, as you mentioned, with the kind of a mid Atlantic accent, like the upper classes wanted to pretend that they were uh, European. And now the whole trend is, sure. is this kind of a third worldism, which you see with the kind of bobos and the, and uh, kind of fetishizing a third world culture. And you see that with uh, hipsters, with the uh, with the whole kind of suburban thing. Uh, a lot of these uh, w- uh, white people, upper middle class whites from the suburbs, they feel that their life style is too uh, boring, so they present a more uh, positive solution that does benefit middle and upper middle class white people but it's also more positive urban aspects and maybe a culture that is more uh, sophisticated or European or even Swipple so uh, we yeah we do kind of uh, offer a uh, positive alternative as opposed to because uh, the the kind of uh, reactionary populist right they criticize they'll criticize Bobos and Swipples but they don't really have a lot to uh, offer. Right. I mean, try to think deeply about where the term trust the foreign actually came from. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously going, it comes from two terms, uh, trust fund and Rastafarian, you know, and it, it sort of embodies exactly what you were just discussing there. Like, you know, Rastafarian is, is a third world. A lot of people don't really even think deeply about who Rastas really were. Like they were a group of people that had spiritual beliefs about, uh, British imperialism, and they wanted to destroy, the, essentially destroy the white man. How Bob Marley uh, and Rastafarian culture became popular with Jewish kids from Long Island is really <laughs> beyond me. But you know, <laughs> uh, you know, humanity seems to have this. Are you talking about that that, uh, that musician who's an Orthodox Jew who does reggae, or you're talking about Modest Yahoo? That's, oh, right. a good, that's a good example there. Like, you know, why does, how did he get exposed to those music styles? And and how did we, we even arrive at the point where we think Hasidic Judaism and reggae are somehow compatible ideas? <laughs> you know, they're very much not. I mean, I guess traditionally, if you really want to trace the, the genealogy of those two things, they're totally unrelated um, ideas. You know, so that's a pretty good example of, of what you just described. You know, they're kind of like co-opting the third world. So basically the problem with society is we're having these uh, large numbers of people who are getting basically left out or left behind. I mean, the obvious example is a more uh, traditional uh, white proletariat, and those people have been screwed over for like a very long time. But what's really important to point out is the more traditional white proletariat. I mean, the people, you could sort of say like the Reagan Democrats, but... Uh, uh, people, I mean, people in the Rust Belt, but going way like the people in extreme poverty, like in the Appalachias, like they have no connection whatsoever with like Bobos and uh, Swipples. I think what is uh, important to point out is that now there's this growing trend of a lot of uh, people who are uh, upper from maybe an upper middle class background uh, have uh, college degrees, including from prestigious universities. Uh, and these are actually people who are not just uh, culturally connected, but also uh, much closer uh, genetically to these elites. So I think these are the people who maybe would have had potential to make it to the elite in the past, but they're being excluded either for having the wrong opinions or just not having the right uh, social connections. So I think this group doesn't get discussed I think it's much easier for the media to talk about the kind of stereotype of like the of these like so-called uh, deplorables, but the people who basically like like that are stere- like the stereotypical deplorables, they're not seen as much of a threat because I think what they view as the biggest threat is not not so much the pro like the white proletariat or the proletariat in general, but the idea of kind of a rival elite and a group of people who are yeah. actually linked to them uh, culturally and genetically. Well, I don't well, know if they think... know these people exist yet. Because, I mean, I, I work with people who, who are, you know, very anti-Trump, etc. 
And um, they're always just talking about, you know, they're always just shitting on, on poor white America, basically. I don't think they real oh, they, they certainly don't realize what the opinions I have. Uh, well, I would rubbing, basically rubbing say that uh, all three of us right here fit into that demographic. Yeah, I just don't think it's very visible yet, which uh, I think it's a rising tide. Okay, I mean, I just want to say a couple of quick things. You know, first off, you know, a big, what, what we were talking about before, you know, this Trustafarian phenomenon, you know, what really what these kids are. You know, they're, they're pioneering because, you know, their class is just, it's crowded, you know? That's basically the problem. You, you know, we like to say, phrase it as, oh, well, this is such an empty world. I, I remember I knew a kid once. I met him, and I think it was in Phoenix or something, and he was he was born into a similar kind of class to me. He went to Wharton. And this kid was like this frantic lunatic about starting, start, you know, about uh, startup companies. He really, and he was a very short statured person, and you know, and I think maybe that was why he was particularly pronounced in his in his his aims to become this wealthy person because that's the only way that he would ever have status in the society that he was born into, right? So he he exhibited virtually all of the things that you're mentioning here, and the thing that was driving him was wasn't just like he was bored with it; it was that he wasn't really fully accepted, you know, or, or his his position in the hierarchy was very, very low to the point where, you know, he's probably considering, would I actually have it better if I defected and went to this other class of people and lived among them as a slightly more educated, you know, Walmart shopper or something like that, right? And, you know, which brings me to my other point. Um, you know, th this group of people, you know, th there's a lot of these groups of whites in America that are never discussed. I call these this place Neverland. Which is like this, it's kind of like, you know, they're often suburban but lower income suburbs. And th those places are growing, by the way, certainly in California. Ars, right, so you're not talking and, about the lump, white lumpen proletariat, like the stereotype of people in trailer parks. You're talking about the kind of lower middle class people who maybe in the past they were in Southern California and they're getting pushed out to like uh, Phoenix, more of those people. Right, I mean, that's... That's a very, it's a very uh, typical sort of move for this type of person. You know, they lived in California, and then suddenly they found themselves unable to maintain in California. You know, an Indian got their job or something like that, and you know, they, so they take their bundle and then they move to Phoenix instead. So, I mean, th this group of people, especially young people that are found that are finding themselves in this spot, I mean, they are some of the most dejected of all Americans, I would say. They have it worse than illegal aliens have it um, in America. Yeah, that's what makes it uh, much worse, because the sort of traditional groups, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, black people have had it pretty bad in this country, and I mean, that's, I mean, that's so obvious, you don't have to say, and the white proletariat has had it bad pr a pretty long time, and then the more working class whites have uh they, I mean they had a period where they were doing okay and then in the 80s uh, their manufacturing jobs started going overseas I mean we're we're actually talking about a group of uh people who were pretty much I mean they they formed basically the core of uh, I mean not just people who had like upper middle class uh, white collar jobs and uh a lot in a lot of cases these are probably people who could be maybe like second or third cousins to a lot of these uh, same elites. So they're people, as I said, they're culturally and genetically uh, linked. So that makes them actually right. a bigger, a bigger mm -hmm. rival than, uh, than, than the more proletariat groups. But that also makes them a bigger uh, threat. And they're not being uh, discussed. I mean, I think these right. individuals, I think, I mean, the stereotype of the alt-right is more that they're kind of rednecks, but actually, no, they're more... I mean, this type of group is vastly overrepresented in the alt-right. I also think this demographic makes a huge uh, portion of the Bernie Sanders movement, and it's a growing, I mean, it is a very uh, significant demographic group. Matthew, didn't you write mm -hmm. one of your earliest articles on this theme? Uh, yeah, gosh, what was that called? Uh, it, was, it was something pretentious and stupid. A Guide to Alt-Center Aesthetic Warfare, I think oh, was what it was called. Oh, right. I think that was the <laughs> but, one where you even met, referenced uh, Kevin Lynn of uh, Progressives for immigration reform? Yeah, that was an earlier attempt, uh, an earlier stage in my development of thinking. But, but yeah, I mean, it was about... Um, it was basically that general theme of um, kind of uh, conceiving of a new subculture to replace 
hipster subculture, basically winning uh, people o- away from a sort of uh, what I see as a very dead uh, kind of liberal ideology toward um, toward something new, toward something that you know something that of the sort that we talk about on this show, a kind of combination of um, Ber- Bernie economics with um, you know in a but in a more slightly more identitarian direction. And yeah, we've uh, I mean we've kind of addressed that on a number. Yeah, I mean we've addressed that. That's been a major uh, theme of this show. So uh, I really think that uh, people talk a lot about uh, populism, and uh, you definitely need uh, populism to a degree. I mean I think change. Do- I mean change often comes from dispossessed uh, f- former members of uh, older upper classes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean uh, it's. A lot of you know you need a, a kind of partnership between the proletariat and between and also people who have access to higher society and the aesthetics and uh, education that that can bring. And when, once you have those forces of society working together, that's when you have a more uh, truly revolutionary uh, coalition. Because the proletariat, and this I, I say this with sadness, the proletariat can always be quashed. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like the question is. You know who are where? Where is the discontent? You know, there's like this problem of we don't hear from these people, and I see them all all the time. I used to live in Arizona. I currently live in Florida, um, and these people are all around me. It's people who have no real access to American life. You know, the, the sort of person who's working a, ser- a service job at, at a supermarket or something, or they're working at mm-hmm. Dunkin' Donuts. They have no. There's no like. They're, they're completely stuck in that position yeah. for life, and that and that that demographic is growing. I mean, you've, there's always yeah. been poor people that have been um, the victims of capitalism. That's nothing new. But I guess what what does seem new is this growing, uh, I guess, kind of middle class. I mean, there was this article in the Atlantic that I um, posted on my Facebook a while ago uh, about how you know there's this notion that a lot of people voted for Trump because of economic woes. Which obviously some people did, but the, this point, the, this article's point was um, that uh, many people that it was a more perceived existential threat. Uh, there's more of a sense like it, it, it's people that have means at the moment, but just don't necessarily see a future for themselves or, or their children. They're, they're increasingly alienated from the elite of this country, um, and it's and I identify with that very strongly, um, and I think it's a growing group of people. Well, what- yeah, go on. What do you believe? What do you believe is the answer? You know, do you have like a plan, so to speak? You know, I mean, a lot of people have different ideas about what to do at this point. I think we're all sort of agreement in how everything works and what what the essence of the problem is. Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, we could either go in one of two directions. We be, we can become a more stratified, like distinctly class based society, right? I mean, we can't all be rich. We can't all be famous. It's just it's that's impossible. You know, or we can maybe um, like fragment. I think that's some people's ideas become yeah, kind of uh, pan secessionism or tribalism. R- yeah, something like that. Exactly. Like yeah. become less of a monolithic society because just America just doesn't work as a as a as a as a whole anymore. You know, there's too many. It's, it doesn't. Yeah. Regionalized interests, but yeah, it's kind of a tough call for me. Like exactly what is the solution to this problem? So yeah, that's what's happening is, uh, I mean, a lot of those people you're talking about who are moving out to Phoenix, they're probably from kind of the more, uh, they're from the traditional uh, white middle class of Southern California, but the new yeah. trend now is you have people who are upper upper middle class and doing really well, uh, basically the millennial children of the upper middle class, uh, they're feeling a strain, and that, I mean, that's a really new phenomenon, because... Uh, Traditionally, the upper middle class has uh, always had it uh, really good. And, I mean, there's a number of different factors. There's this massive uh, student loan debt to get into elite universities. There's a change in immigration. Where we're seeing a massive increase in uh, more, like, like with the whole, uh, a lot of the H-1B visas, I and mean, that's a big factor. Well, I mean, one factor is uh, education in uh, these big urban areas where the the school systems put a lot of pressure on the upper middle class to send their kids to private school. So 
I mean, this is this demographic that's historically had it really good. Now they're starting to feel pressure. So uh, all these groups are under uh, pressure. And pretty much, I mean, everyone is except for the very uh, tiny, uh, like, ultra-rich, like, the top 1% or even smaller than that. There's just this very small percentage of people who have it good. And then the rest of those other people, like the upper middle class and the kind of moderately wealthy. And, uh, I mean, Josh, as you said uh, earlier, you kind of uh, fit that profile in a sense that you grew up. I mean, you kind of grew up, you kind of came from that uh, demographic. I mean, I kind of felt like I had a bit of a crisis of conscience, really. Like, you know, I just got to a point where I concluded that, you know, this whole system was not ethical, you know, and I, I couldn't really operate in it, uh, you know, 100% um, in the way that maybe others could. You came, yeah, you came at it from a very a more introspective and conscientious standpoint. A lot of, I think a lot of people from that background, they're just, start, well, they'll start to feel more the economic uh, pressure and the intense uh, competition to make it into the very, because there's a very limited number of slots, and then they'll realize things are not working. So I, th- I think the solution for change is not so much is not so much just to be a reactionary, but actually address a lot of the cultural and uh, economic concerns. I would say that uh, I don't know if this is the best way, but this is this is my way because this is what I what I know about and what I'm somewhat good at. Is my you know Josh had asked earlier you know what I think the solution is uh, in terms of secessionism. I don't I don't know what to come with that, but subculture would be my my response i mean i i would like to cultivate um you know collections of different values and meanings that are uh very compelling and in particular aesthetically compelling alternative to to what what passes uh for subculture in in a modern urban society because i think it's very much i think i think the time is uh is ripe for a kind of new new subculture to emerge I definitely agree that the subculture we have now is very stale and you know, certainly lacks any kind of real um, vitamins, you know, so to use a to use a metaphor there. Um, because, as we said before, you know, the people that are operating these subcultures are really not, they're like the wrong people. You know, they're coming from a different. They're coming from the elites and they're posing as someone who's our friend. You know, has the same problems as us. When really they don't have the same problems unless they're a completely different class of, of person. Um, so I guess I mean authenticity is obviously the issue at hand here. You know how do we determine what are the right va- you know for for one thing what are the right values and how do we make sure that they're maintained properly? And that's really the the culture that we should be rallying around. Uh, you know, how do we arrive at that? I don't know. Certainly, it's not through social media because social media is a big, big part of the problem. We are at the end of the show. I would like to uh, thank uh, Josh Seidner and uh, Matthew uh, Pegas for being on. And also, it's uh, worth checking out that book, uh, Bobos in Paradise, if uh, you're interested in these topics. And uh, that will obviously that will uh, hopefully uh, spark uh, further discussion. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome.